Chapter Three of Heroines of Travel by Frank Mundell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Rockies. In reading the story of Miss Bird's adventures in the Rocky Mountains, we find it difficult to realize that the writer of these stirring pages is a woman. Indeed, there are many men who would not have cared to face the difficulties and dangers which this distinguished woman traveller cheerfully encountered to satisfy her love of travel. Picture to yourself the accommodation for visitors at a house in the wilderness where she stayed for some time. There was no table, no bed, no basin, no towel, no glass, no window, no fastening on the door. There were holes in the roof, the logs were unchinked, and one end of the cabin was partially removed. The charge for board and lodging was 25 shillings a week, with the proviso that the lodger would make herself agreeable. This she tried to do, but her advances were met in such a dubious fashion that she was not over sanguine about the result. Nor was it easy to fall asleep with wolves rummaging under the floors, and now and then a fox or a skunk rushing in at the open end of the cabin and making a speedy an exit through the unglazed window, or seeing the head of a snake thrust up through a chink in the floor. This was in Colorado, where the climate is one of the finest in the world, and people can safely sleep out of doors for six months in the year. The only objection the lady had to sleeping in the open was the presence of reptiles. They seemed to be everywhere. Rattlesnakes and moccasin snakes, both deadly. Carpet snakes and green racers, reputed dangerous. Water snakes, tree snakes and mouse snakes, harmless but abominable. The first few days after she put up at this place, seven rattlesnakes were destroyed. One that she herself had killed had a rattle of eleven joints. Having bought a young bronco mare, Miss Bird attempted to mount her purchase. No sooner did she touch the saddle than the animal leaped over a heap of timber. The girth gave way, and the would-be rider fell over the mare's tail, receiving at the same time a parting kick on her knee. Though badly bruised, Miss Bird had no bones broken. Cold water dressings, she thought, would soon put matters right, especially as circumstances did not admit of making a fuss. Indeed, she was much more anxious about the rents in her riding dress than the cuts and bruises on almost every part of her body. Shortly before her arrival in this region, Long's Peak, the American Matterhorn, as it is sometimes called, had been ascended for the first time. It is nearly 15,000 feet high. Anxious to enjoy the view from the summit, the traveller arranged with Mountain Jim to guide her to the top. This man was one of those famous scouts of the plains, of whom so much was heard in the days of the Indian frontier warfare, a desperate character, yet not without some noble traits. When his sober said the settler who recommended him to Miss Bird. Jim's a perfect gentleman. But when he's had liquor, he's the most awful ruffian in Colorado. Together the unarmed lady traveller and the desperado, armed to the teeth with knife and revolver, axe and rifle, set out. The climb to the summit was of the most exciting description and but for the assistance of her companion 
the lady could not have accomplished her purpose. In some parts she had to be hauled up like a bale of goods. Slipping, faltering, gasping for breath, she still mounted upwards, until, crawling on hands and knees, the peak was won at last. The intrepid lady stood on the summit of this mountain, the lonely sentinel of the rocky range, from whence she could see the waters start for the eastern and western oceans. Here she witnessed a magnificent sunrise. At first as a dazzling streak, but enlarging rapidly into a dazzling sphere, the sun wheeled above the grey line, a light and glory as when it was first created. Jim involuntarily and reverently uncovered his head and exclaimed, I believe there is a god. The descent was even more perilous than the ascent, and Miss Bird with difficulty kept her feet. Again and again she fell. Once she hung on to a ledge of rock by her dress, and the garment had to be cut away with Jim's hunting knife. Fortunately, she fell into a crevice of soft snow and escaped with a few bruises. So exhausted was she when the first resting place was reached, that she had to be carried, wrapped in blankets, to the camping ground. There, with the guide's dog lying by her side, she lay for hours looking up at the beloved stars of her far-off home. Her lonely rides for days together show that, like Nelson, she did not know what fear was. At that time, only twenty years ago, there were bands of bloodthirsty Indians and lawless white men who regarded the far west as their legitimate hunting ground, and who would as soon shoot a man as a bear. Dark stories of robbery and murder met Miss Bird at every stage of her journey, but she passed unmolested through all. Everywhere she found that the men had a habit of respectful courtesy to women, which she scarcely expected to find in these regions. The owner of a shanty, who lent her a horse to visit the famous Donna Lake, said to her when she started for an evening ride, "'There's a bad breed of ruffians about, but the ugliest among them all won't touch you.' There's nothing Western folk admire so much as pluck in a woman. One night Miss Bird slept in a house in a mining place called Hall's Gulch. In the morning she was horrified to find a man hanging on a tree only a few paces from the door. He had been lynched just before her arrival, and such a deed of violence was so little thought of that all appearance of excitement had died away in a few hours. Certainly, says the traveller, had I known what a ghastly burden that tree bore, I would have encountered the ice and gloom of the gulch rather than have slept there. On another of her solitary rides, she was joined by a horseman who rode for many miles by her side. He was a handsome man, well mounted and exceptionally well armed, even for a country where every able bodied man was a moving arsenal. He had a rifle laid across his saddle, a pair of pistols in the holsters, two revolvers and a knife in his belt, and a carbine slung behind him. As they rode along together, the stranger beguiled the way with stories of hunting and adventures, and had much to say about the cruelty and treachery of the Indians. After a brief rest at a cabin for refreshments, they remounted and rode to the crest of the Continental Divide, from which a magnificent view of the surrounding country was obtained. 
Here Miss Bird said goodbye to the hunter, and returned to the cabin, where she asked the woman about her late companion. "'I'm sure you found Comanche Bill a real gentleman,' said the woman. Then she found that the intelligent, courteous man, in whom she had been so much interested, was one of the most notorious desperadoes of the Rocky Mountains, and the greatest Indian exterminator on the frontier. Some members of his family had been massacred in an Indian raid, and from that time he had shot down the red men wherever he could find them. Having spent all her money, Miss Bird had to wait for supplies, which she hoped would reach her in a few days. With two young men, both strangers to her, she roughed it in a mountain cabin for nearly a month. Food was scarce, for the ground was covered with snow, and the cold very intense. While the men hunted, she kept house for them, and made things as comfortable as was possible under the circumstances. They had no sheets, no towels, and no tablecloths. The beds were large bags filled with hay, and the floor was two inches deep in mud. At length, Miss Bird determined to make an attempt to reach the plains. I've seen many foolish people, said one of her friends to her when she announced her departure, but never one so foolish as you. You haven't a grain of sense. Why, I, an old mountaineer, wouldn't go down to the plains today. Having, however, made up her mind, she was not to be turned aside, even by such a warning, and accordingly set out on what she calls her eerie ride, followed by the protests of her friends. The snow lay deep on every side, and the surface was marked with the footprints of numerous birds and beasts. Without knowing it, she crossed over many an ice bridge which spanned deep streams, and she rode through gulches where a false step would have cost her her life. High overhead, the great mountain eagle sailed, on the watch for his prey. It was a fearful ride. A snowstorm came on, and the wind was loaded with fine hard crystals, which literally cut her face and made the blood flow. Once her pony carried her onto a lake and fell through the ice into the water. It was a hard struggle to get back again to land. The cold brought tears into her eyes, and the moisture quickly froze, closing the eyelids so that she could scarcely see her way. When at length she reached Longmount, her destination, she had to be lifted off her horse and carried into the hotel. There, hot drinks and warm blankets soon restored life to her benumbed limbs, and she seemed little the worse for her daring ride. The dangers through which she passed may be estimated from a remark made by the landlord to his wife just before Miss Bird arrived. He said, If there's a traveller on the prairie tonight, God help him. At this hotel, she found the person who had charge of her money stormbound, and on the following day, she set out again. With two companions, she rode fifteen miles, and then stopped at a ranch for a short rest. Hearing that she was going on, the trapper exclaimed, What? That woman going into the mountains alone? She'll lose the track or be froze to death. When, however, she told him she had ridden in the storm two days before and not lost her way and had travelled over 600 miles alone in the mountains, he treated her with great respect as a fellow mountaineer. When she departed, he gave her some matches, saying, 
you'll have to camp anyhow and you'd better make a fire than be froze to death returning after her wanderings to the mountain cabin miss bird prepared for her final departure from the rockies she was loath to go and the friends she had made in the wilds of the west were reluctant to part with one whose influence for good upon their rough natures and abandoned lives had been truly remarkable at length she said good-bye and turned her horse's head towards the east mountain jim rode with her part of the way and in that last interview told her that bad as he was he never lay down to sleep without prayer prayer chiefly that god would give him a happy death together they stayed at a small inn at st louis when the landlady heard who miss bird's companion was she expressed unbounded astonishment that quiet kind gentleman rocky mountain jim she exclaimed why i have frightened the children by telling them that if they were naughty he would carry them off nor could she believe that a man of so pleasing a bearing could be guilty of the misdeeds attributed to him before parting with her trusty guide miss bird pleaded with him to give up his drinking habits and lead a better life it might have been once he replied sadly but now it is too late too late the traveller's influence however prevailed in the end and jim promised to reform his life but it was indeed too late a few months later a dreadful tragedy was enacted among the mountains and jim fell shot by a man with whom he had long been on friendly terms when they had parted and as miss bird was driving away she looked back and her heart was filled with mingled feelings of pleasure and regret she says i never realized that my rocky mountain life was at an end not even when i saw mountain jim his golden hair yellow in the sunshine leading the beautiful mare over the snowy plains equipped with the saddle on which i had ridden eight hundred miles End of chapter three